You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. David, today we're going to talk about how to crush your competition. Is that right? (laughs) Instantly, I got very excited about the concept. That's really not what we're going to talk about, but I love that idea. Oh my God, I'm just too competitive. But that's actually the opposite of what we're going to talk about, I think, unless you want to switch it at the last minute. No, I was with a bunch of guys the other night, had this little men's night retreat thing, and maybe more than half of them were entrepreneurs. And one guy was kind of winding down a business and he was saying, I'm not sure if I'm competitive enough to be in business. I didn't say anything, but I thought, "Mm, I suppose that's vital for you to be competitive in your nature to succeed in business. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. But there's something wrapped around competitiveness that is just as important to me, and that's risk taking. Yeah. But it does seem like the two of those are related. Like That's why I quit doing a few things outside of work, because I realized I was not as competitive as some of the young fools that were willing to sacrifice their body. <laughs> and I wasn't. It's not that my body is so precious it's, it shouldn't be sacrificed. It was more I was allergic to the pain. But yeah, there's something about competitiveness and risk-taking. Yeah, for sure. I'm competitive. Do you think of yourself as competitive? I've measured my competitiveness and your competitiveness, and you're, you're more competitive than I am. I'm as competitive as the average person. But the makeup of that competitiveness is a little bit skewed you can break down competitiveness into different forms. So I kind of think of myself as average competitiveness. Mm, Okay. This is more about how do we tame or tamp down some of our competitiveness for our advantage and for the advantage of the world, really. You really want to talk about this idea of collaborating with your competitors. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. And it's something I've learned in my own business life, but I've also tried to coach my clients to do it as well. And it's been really interesting. It's almost, it's a concept that strikes us like, did he really just say you should be more collaborative with your competitors or did I mishear him? No, that's really what I mean. Okay. So we think of being in business, just like my friend said the other night, we think of it as business is highly competitive and we need to be cutthroat and we need to always have an eye on our competition. We're trying to best them. I'm fond of saying that positioning is an act of relativity. You position relative to your competition and in endeavoring to position your firm against your competition, you're trying to kill them. Now that's an overstatement. But that's kind of the prevailing view, right? The competitors are their people that it's your job to beat. It's your job to win against them. And you want to kind of fly in the face of that a little bit. So where where did this idea come from? Well, it's been rooted really in 20 plus years. I did something a little crazy back in the late, late 90s. I wanted to start an event and that was obvious to me. I wanted to start an event. Okay, so what kind of an event would it be? Well, it needs to be an event that's going to attract a lot of people. How do we do that? Well, the content has to be fantastic. It's like, okay, then I just stopped in my tracks because I'm thinking, well, if the content's going to be great, then I've got to invite a lot of my competitors there. We don't see eye to eye on everything, but I need to have them there because they're very smart. People are going to come and want to hear from them as well. Like what kind of a stupid conference would it be where I'm the only one speaking? That's not a conference. That's sort of like your own personal platform. So I was faced with a decision. Do I really want to give my competitors a platform? And I was nervous about it. Other people were a lot more nervous about it than I was. They thought I was kind of crazy to be doing that. But I thought, well, this is a worthwhile experiment. And maybe there's some value in being the person who organizes the conference and does the programming for it. There turned out to be that sort of value, but it was a wonderful experience. It opened up my eyes entirely to the fact that I don't have to make somebody else lose in order for me to win, that I can let my guard down. And it actually translated into the way I run events now. People come to an event for the first time and they're surprised that within about an hour, an hour and a half of the start of the event, people are starting to share stuff that they would not have thought they'd see themselves sharing at the beginning. They're much more transparent about it. And it's just sort of that style that I like to have. It fits with this notion of of competitors. But recently, what what struck me, and then I'll shut up for a minute because I know I'm taking a long time to answer your question. I was listening to the Dan Patrick Daily Talk radio sports show, and he was talking about interviewing Kobe Bryant one time. And they were talking about how do you get yourself up for a game that doesn't really matter? In other words, maybe you're out of the playoffs already, 
or you know you're going to beat this team because they're not good. And what Kobe Bryant said was, at the end of the game, I want my competitor to question why they even got into the sports game. I want them to question why they even became a basketball player, right? And I thought, well, that's kind of funny, but it's really not the kind of spirit I want as a collaborator. Hmm. Even when he's playing in a game that they're almost certain to win in, he's still thinking about crushing the spirit yeah, of his right. competitors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's the point of that? Do you still have a page on your website that lists your competitors? I do. Right. I do. Am I on there? I don't know. I know you don't want to be, so yeah. let's just say you're not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you had me on there and I called you up and said, get me off that list. Right. I don't know why that is. Okay. So you conceived of this idea, this event, and you had a partner in this event. Can we name the event? Yeah. It's MYOB, Mind Your Own Business. Yeah. The how people were the financial partners and the marketing partners, and I did the programming. And that's where you and I first met in 2003. I reached out to you when I started my business somewhere in 2002, and you invited me to speak at this thing. Yeah. And look at how much good has come from that, right? Yeah. You and I have become friends. We do a podcast together. We share a lot of clients. And here's the biggest thing. I learned so much by having you there. I mean, the very first time I heard you speak, I learned so much. It made me such a better advisor. And the same could be said of the other folks, not everybody, but most of the other folks that I invited. It's like, oh, wow. I just, it made me a much better advisor for, by listening to them in that kind of a setting. So let's walk through how somebody can, once they get their head around this idea, how they can kind of put it into practice. But first, I can imagine what the objections are, right? So when you're talking to somebody about this idea of like, be more open to your competitors and collaborative with them, what's the first thing that comes up objection-wise? Well, it comes up a lot too. And it's like, oh, that's a good idea, but I can't put that on my website because what if my competitors see it? And it may be something like our new focus. That's usually not as big an issue, but things like client criteria or some unique way we have of going about solving problems for clients or a case study or something like that. They envision these competitors in the wee hours of the morning, sneaking onto their website and furiously copying things down and grabbing screenshots and then reinventing their own firm as if they're really doing that. That's the objection. I don't want my competitors to see that. I don't want them to copy me. Do you hear that or do you see it in other ways? I'm curious if it's just my clients. I'm not sure if I hear it a lot, but I sense it a lot and I've kind of experienced it myself too. But my own experience has been, if you're really carving out a path of leadership in something, it means you're constantly either reinventing your business right. or coming up with new IP, with new ideas. And by the time somebody's adopted something that you've, let's call it stolen, stolen something that you've put on your website and made it their own, you should be somewhere else, right? You should be off into the distance. Right. And that's part of your practice, part of my practice, part of what we urge clients to do is to reinvent themselves frequently every couple of years, maybe. And so while this may work beautifully for you now, it's not going to be the thing that you're doing down the road, reinventing. But let's talk about the whole positioning thing. How many competitors does win without pitching have? It really depends on how you kind of frame the question. If you look at sales training for creative professionals, I don't actually know of any other organization that kind of frames their value proposition the discipline and the market, the combination of a discipline and market that way. But that would be like ridiculous for me to say there's no direct competitor. So that's the very narrowest, like who else says we just do sales training for creative right, professionals. Right. And, but our real competition is any new business consultant to the creative professions right. and anybody who's selling sales training. Most sales trainers aren't specific to a market. So anybody in the sales training business, any new business consultant. So if somebody popped up, Let's say you just heard through a client of yours or something, and they said, hey, have you seen which it looks a lot like yours? So pretend that you have this conversation with them, and you look at the website, and it is the same positioning, sales training for creative professionals or creative entrepreneurs. What would your reaction be? My reaction would be I would gird myself for a fight in the most positive sort of way. I love a challenge. Hmm. 
if somebody was using that same language, I would just kind of steal myself and whip my team into a frenzy and kind of <laughs> like run out into the battlefield. I'm picturing this movie scene, you know, yelling to the sky. Yeah, Braveheart. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> somebody would have to be using like very specific language, very specific to me. But one of the things that I've seen over the last few years is when I started my business back in 2002, when I was a new business consultant, there were very few new business consultants or whoever was out there. The internet was still a relatively new thing, right? Web browsers were about seven or eight years old in 2002. So if there was a lot of competitors out there, I wasn't aware of them. I was really aware of two or three. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, there's rarely a week or a two-week period that goes by where I'm not made aware of a new new business consultant. And I made this conscious decision a couple of years ago to just quit thinking about them as competitors and just to think about them as my future distribution network. And I recently put out a call on LinkedIn saying, I want to forge a closer relationship with the world's best new business consultants. And I know there's a, I've met a lot of consultants out there who say, I give your book, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, to all of my clients. What I said in this post on LinkedIn, I had about 30 inquiries from it, is if you're already kind of preaching the principles and if you're already kind of teaching the win without pitching way and you're interested in formalizing the relationship, then reach out to me. I had to see somebody else doing that and somebody else talk about the benefit of it just the way that you're doing it now. Yeah. For me to kind of just have this switch in my mind. You've been very good at this and you've been a very good role model for me in this, in being kind of a generous competitor. And it hasn't been in my nature. I'm the person who kind of loves a fight. So something has shifted in me in the last couple of years. And I, I look around at people I know in business and some people that you and I both compete with. They are such open, generous, sharing people, even though we are fairly direct competitors. Right. I've just decided that these are going to be my role models in that front, too. I'm mellowing in my old age or something because something's definitely changed. Yeah, it is really interesting to see. I'm doing an event shortly and I've invited, you'll be speaking there. It's really important to me that you speak there to address the whole sales training process. I'm just unqualified to even speak to it, but I feel like the people coming need to hear that. But then I think four of my competitors will be there. They won't have a platform, but I will introduce them. They're coming for free. I invited them and I plan to put them to work. It's like, you know, we're going to split up into groups and we're going to try to apply these positioning principles to the individual firms. And these, these competitors know what they're doing. And and so the evil side of somebody might hear that and say, well, wouldn't someone just hire one of these? And it's like, well, that's fine. Because in my mind, feeling like you have all these competitors is really misunderstanding the fact that it's not just about what you do, but it's about how you do it. So I have a very specific style. And whenever I try to cross the line and be somebody that I'm not to a client, like more of a coach or something like that, I am doing a disservice to them and I'm doing a disservice to me. So I find it really wonderful to have these other folks who are very good at what they do, who have a more appropriate style for certain clients. And when I think about living in a world where I couldn't recommend other options for my clients, it's a little bit sadder to me because I do want my clients to get help, even if it's not with me. Now, what's interesting, though, is we have different approaches to this when we're not as busy. Yeah. So like we tend to be a little bit less generous when our businesses aren't run well, when we don't have a steady stream of opportunity. That's just another argument of a hundred arguments to run your firm well so that you're not paralyzed by not enough work or thinner margins or something like that. You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker of Recourses, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. I was going to play devil's advocate here a little bit and push back and say, well, it's easy for you to be magnanimous this way. You're the worldwide leader in your field. You've got all the work you want. Um, I think most people from the outside looking in would see that. So it's easy for you to just kind of say, well, there's plenty for everyone. 
But if you're running an independent creative firm, you've got a dozen people, you're not seen as meaningfully different. Do you think the principle still applies? No, I don't. And I think the solution there is to have a positioning where it's so much clearer to you and to your prospects where you're a perfect fit. So if you haven't nailed that positioning equation yet for your firm, then I think this is a very dangerous thing to do, right? Now, you could still be generous in some other ways, like you could be generous in sharing contractors with other agencies or even some employees. But in terms of clients, I think that would be a dangerous thing to do if you haven't Well, a couple things, not just positioning, but also having this lead generation process in place. You and I have talked quite a bit about this, how we have a simplified plan that's driven by discipline. So if you don't have the positioning and the lead generation in place, then it's a pretty dangerous thing to be this magnanimous. But the way to fix that is not to be selfish. The way to fix it is to fix your positioning and lead generation. Do you find that your generosity towards your competitors is returned? Do you, are you referred business or other similar invitations from these competitors? In some cases, I am for sure. I think about Tim Williams, for instance, yeah. who I think does really good work. And I've sent work his way. He sent work my way for sure. I think about Carl Sackis. I think about the folks at Newfangled. I think about Philip at the Consulting Pipeline podcast. I think about Drew McClellan. You know, I, I hate mentioning names because there's going to be a bunch of names I've left off. But in general, yes, absolutely. And even at the beginning where they're taken aback by the generosity, they'll soften up over a few years and discover that it's real. I'm really trying to help them. I'm not trying to hurt them. And, and that started years ago. Like you write a new book or you have a new program, tell all your competitors about it in a gracious, respectful way. Like, hey, this is where I'm headed. I just wanted to let you know. And oh, by the way, here's a copy of the book. Hope you're doing well. And you see an article that's really helpful that would benefit them. You send it to them. Or I'll tell you, a big one is speaking engagements. Yeah. If I've been on the platform somewhere and I talk with the program person, I say, listen, this was fantastic. I love this event. I appreciate you inviting me. Do you want a couple of suggestions for people who are also would be a really good fit for this? And that's a perfect opportunity to extend that graciousness to one of your competitors. And I find that you're not hurting yourself in any way. You're simply helping everybody in the process. And I found that to be very effective. And I've had a lot of my competitors do the same for me where they've introduced me to a speaking opportunity, and it's been very, very much appreciated. A guy I know who does over a million dollars a year in speaking fees said to me, the number one lead source for speaking engagements is other speakers, right? So they get approached and say, well, I can't do it, but you might want to think of this other person. So he said, it's important for you to cultivate relationships with these other speakers. And that means you start referring speaking opportunities to them. That's interesting. Two weeks later, I was invited to speak in Dubai when I was in another part of the world, and I <laughs> referred to my new friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new friend, because you didn't want that long travel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about some specific ways agency principals can collaborate with their competitors. I think I've got a list here of some things that you've identified. At the top of the list, you've got learn how to run your firm from each other. Do you want to unpack? Oh, I just said the word unpack. Do you want to peel that apart? <laughs> <laughs> that even sounds more pretentious like than a unpack. Orange. <laughs> let's just let's just say unpack, okay? Yeah. Yeah. What's the possible benefit in not helping another principal run their firm well? Well, hoping that they'll fail? Well, that seems pretty evil, right? The one area where it seems like there's the most benefit for everybody is to learn how to run your business well. So you've learned some principles about like key metrics you want to look at or how to hire the right person or how to run a meeting better or how to have the best relationship with your bank or, you know, there's a hundred things we could list there. Those are the kinds of things that I would put at the top of the list because nobody enters this field with the sort of business management training that would really benefit them. They're all starting from some other skill path, not a role path. And so they come into the business and they have to learn everything either from somebody that they worked for. And often that's the best place to learn it. A great example of a principal that you worked for before you started off on your own, or they learn it from maybe an advisor, you know, like a paid advisor, or they maybe they learn it from another principal. So that would be the first area I would suggest collaboration. It could be informal or formal. I find that most principals have three or four people that they're friendly with. They can just shoot them an email or get on the phone and say, hey, I'm facing this. I'm facing this non-compete situation. What have you learned? Or can you introduce me to a lawyer or something like that? 
All that's great, including on here, help find good employees. And I was thinking about, there's an agency principal in Australia. You and I both know him. I've done a bunch of work with him. He's told me some stories of when he's had to fire people. They don't say fire in Australia or the UK. They sack them, (laughs) which always sounds extra harsh to us in North America. And he's told me stories of he brings somebody in who isn't working out, says, you're not working out. I'm letting you go. But I think you've got great skills in these other areas. So I've lined up two interviews for you today. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So he's ruthless when it comes to correcting hiring decisions, but he's very kind in how he goes about it. And he recognizes that, you know, everybody's got strengths and um, he's got good relationships with his competitors. And he's very clear about why he's letting that person go and why he thinks his competitors should think about bringing that person on, usually in a different role. Right. Yeah, I think that's great. Like if it's for the right reasons, there there could be something about the style of this firm that wouldn't be true of another firm. It's not like they're a bad person. They're just not a good fit for this particular role. Is there a line that there's the danger of crossing? The first word I wrote down when you sent me notes on this was collusion. Yeah. (laughs) At some point, can you get too close to your competitors? Does it cause some sort of problem or the perception of problems maybe among clients or maybe even regulators? Yeah. Well, in the U.S., that would fall under the jurisdiction of the FTC, Federal Trade Commission. And where collusion is very clear and you can get your hand slapped pretty quickly would be around pricing. So not so much which opportunities to pursue, although you could get in trouble there like, hey, if I don't pursue this one, can you not pursue that one? That would be collusion. But the main area would be on pricing. Like, how about what's your price on this? And and there have been some specific lawsuits. You know, the Handbook of Pricing and Ethical Guidelines was one example that had to get rewritten because of a lawsuit, as I understand it. So that strikes me as evil, and I don't think we're talking about that so much. It's more like here's an example. So let's say you're going to respond to an RFP. Okay, I know. Don't shriek on me here, Blair. Yeah. But you're going to respond to an RFP. And you know that another agency has been through an RFP process with them. So you might just call them up and say, hey, what was that like? You know, is this even worth it? Most of the time, it's not going to be worth it. But that would not be collusion. That would just be simply sharing public information. I hadn't heard the story around pricing. I was doing a talk on pricing about 18 months ago to an industry group, slightly tangential to the creative professions. And there was a lawyer in the room and he kept warning about collusion. He just, he did not like the idea that the competitors were in the same room talking about pricing. Mm. I thought he was being ridiculous. I think he was being ridiculous. Where it can be collusion is if we're talking about a specific instance. It's not about For instance, labor law allows you to band together against a common enemy, so to speak. That's not collusion. Collusion would be a specific instance related to pricing usually. Gotcha. All right. So if let's say somebody's listening to this and they're warming up to the idea of being more collaborative with their competitors, but they don't currently have relationships with those competitors. How do they go about it? Where do they find these people? Maybe they're so highly specialized or poorly specialized, they're just not sure who their competitors are. How do you go about it? Yeah. If you're poorly positioned, most of your competitors are the ones in your locale geographically. And so you know those because they're there and you share employees and so on. If you're well positioned, your competitors are more known to you, even though they're not close to you geographically. These are the names that keep coming up when you are competing for work and so on. That would be one way to identify them. Obviously, Google's our friend here. Another way to identify them is going to trade conferences. Trade conferences are almost always vertical, or they could be more demographic-oriented conferences, horizontal conferences, where you keep seeing the same people there, not so much exhibiting, but you just see them there, they're speaking and so on. You notice that these are the folks whose articles are appearing in the same places that yours are. So just connecting with them through your contacts within a particular focus would be a good way to connect with them. Another might be a common mentor. I get this question a lot, like, do you know of somebody that's doing this that I could talk with and so on. I don't connect people who aren't clients of mine, but if they are clients of mine, then I'll try to find somebody that connect them with. I actually put roundtables together, which are specific attempts to do this. That's not really the subject of this podcast, but that's an example of of what a, a paid advisor might do or sometimes a common mentor. So like if you're getting advice from an older woman or gentleman in your town who's coaching you on running a good creative business because they've been in that field and they've slowed down a little bit, they usually are going to know somebody else that would be a good fit for you. And I am talking about cooperating with folks who are definitely 
otherwise competitors of yours. I'm not talking about people that you might meet in a YEO or YO kind of a context, I'm talking about people that you'd compete with normally. Okay. Are there instances where this can go wrong? And obviously I wouldn't ask you to name names, but I'm sure there's has to be situations where you started being kind of magnanimous towards a competitor. And then at some point realized this is a one-way relationship where this person is taking and not giving and, yeah. and your idea about them ended up changing. For sure. Yeah. I can think of an attorney actually in New York that I was referring lots of work to. And, and it turned out that not only did they n- never share generously, but they kept asking, kept asking, and it became annoying. And so I just basically shut them down. They still do good work, so I haven't done anything to hurt them at all. But if somebody is actually out to hurt me, then we come into the Kobe Bryant crush them phase, which is actually sort of the evil side of this. And it's kind of fun. You have to do that once or twice a year, right? <laughs> but otherwise, I've just <laughs> – otherwise, I'm just wondering if people are still listening, right? At this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> otherwise, it just doesn't happen because who are the people that are going to hear the worst things about me as an advisor? It's going to be my competitors, right? So – If my competitors hear about me, but their experience in working with me is not at all matching, they're going to pause the conversation and say, "Uh, even just to themselves, you must not be a good client because that's not how I've experienced him. So there's so many advantages here to make this work well. Yeah. You know, it strikes me as this is going to sound a bit corny. It's a bit like love though, right? The more you give, the more you get. And the more open you are and more gracious you are with your competitors the more likely you are to get back. And even if it's not a full reciprocation, there's still that feeling of of you helping others, of kind of your self-worth, et cetera. It's got to escalate. Yeah, for sure. And and there are many times when somebody does great work and you've sent them lots of work, but they're not sending you work. And that's okay because they might be at a different place on the referral chain. Yeah. In other words, by the time they hear of a client, they're past their need for you, whatever you happen to do along that chain. So it can't be a tit for tat thing. It's really just about surrounding yourself with people who are generous in life in many ways. And and I find that that's a very satisfying experience, almost regardless of the outcome. Well, you've convinced me I'm going to start thinking about maybe referring a piece of business to you. Yeah, it's about damn time, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, David. This has been great. Bye, Blair. Thank you for listening to Two Bobs with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com. That's the number two, B-O-B-S.com.